Thank you. Thank you, Marcos. Thank you, uh, Bernadette, Henriette, and Mogens and Marie, uh, for organizing this, this amazing, unique conference. What a, what a thrill it is to be here uh, and to be able to think together about this, this amazing man and this unique body of work. Uh, it is a, a huge privilege, and I'm sure I speak for everyone when I say how grateful we are uh, that you've put this together. Um, if someone asked you the question, how do you think? I wonder what your response would be. Um, I flew over from Australia two days ago, so I'm pretty sure what my response is at the moment. I think very poorly. <laughs> uh, I need a coffee to think at all. Uh, and after about six in the evening, <laughs> I, I really don't think um, uh, with any, anything like uh, the quality that I would wish. But I think if we, if we reflect on the question, how does she think, how does he think of a, of a given writer? Um, I, I think it reveals a lot. It, it's a very pregnant, very full question to ask of, of a particular thinker. Um, we can take it in many different ways. The way that I'm approaching the question in this presentation is how does someone think that they think? How do they describe their own process of thinking? Um, and of course, it's, it's not a trivial question because people in any given historical moment think very differently to each other and people over time have thought very differently in different epochs. Uh, so Plato, for example, thought that his own thought was an unforgetting, an, an amnesis. Uh, Foucault thinks that 16th century thinkers thought by similitude. Uh, so, for example, his, his famous um, example of aconite, the, the seed of the plant that looks a little bit like a human eye. And of course, for the thinkers at the time, it, it necessarily follows that it cures eye diseases. That's the way thinking works. Uh, or Descartes who thought that his thinking uh, was stringing together chains of clear and distinct ideas on the basis of a hyperbolic doubt. Uh, or again, Heidegger, who in his lecture series, Was heißt Denken, what he's called thinking, uh, thought that we moderns really don't think at all uh, when we judge according to established methods and real thinking uh, is a path with no fixed destination uh, that puts us outside ourselves, outside our received ideas. But of course, the question that we're addressing in this paper is how Michel Serre thinks, or at least how he thinks he thinks. Um, but then again, uh, our reconstruction of, of a given thinker's thought is never purely transparent, is it? It's always an interpretation. It's, it's always a particular perspective on that thinker. Uh, and so at the risk of trying your patience this early in the conference, I think we really need to come clean and say that what I'm doing is how I think Sir thinks he thinks. Um, and even with all those qualifiers, it, it is a, a rich and important question, isn't it? It's rich because Sir thinks, as we all know, that's why we're here, in a very distinctive way. A, a way that challenges the way that we think, a, a way that I think causes us to think differently. And it's important because the way that we think governs the sort of conclusions that we can come to. Uh, and Sir's particular way of thinking, and this is what I want to try and argue in this paper, is just the sort of thinking that we need today uh, to respond to the global challenges that we're facing. Now, there are different ways to address the question of how uh, Michel Sir thinks. Uh, and elsewhere in, in the book that I wrote on Sarah and in a, a, a talk that's available online um, that, that, that you can get to uh, if you uh, search for the, um, what's on the screen behind me. Uh, in, in that talk, I tried to uh, approach myself Sarah's thinking through, through these two ideas that he has, a figures of thought and a global intuition. And so I don't want to do that again. I don't want to rehash that material. I want to try and take a different perspective today on how Michel Sarah thinks. And I, I want to approach his thought through three features, three facets, if you like. If you imagine his thought as a diamond coming at it through three different facets, uh, each of which uh, can, can be concretized in terms of a particular image. Uh, we've got a path, a window, and a cave. Uh, three ways of approaching the way uh, that Michel Serre thinks. If we try and sum up that 
globality of his thought. What is it that this is three perspectives onto? Um, I, I think we could do worse than say that, that Michel Serre's thought is a, a, a thought about relations. Um, in a conversation with Bruno Latour, he explains that, quote, uh, no single word, neither substantive nor verb, no domain or speciality alone, characterizes, at least for the moment, the nature of that work. Uh, after which he goes straight on to describe the nature of his work in one substantive, which is um, really rather useful for us, although slightly contradictory with what he said a moment before. And he goes on, I only describe relationships. Uh, for the moment, let's be content with saying it's a general theory of relations. The first angle that I want to take on that general theory of relations uh, is the image of a path. Uh, the image belongs to Descartes, and Sir can't help himself uh, from having a little chuckle about Descartes' image of a path. Uh, Sir doesn't have many named philosophical enemies in his work, uh, but he really does not hold back when it comes to Descartes. Uh, in Le Système de Leibniz, he's lambasting and lampooning Cartesian thought mercilessly from start to finish. Uh, Descartes' comical path is a path through a forest, something, of course, of which Michel Serre knows a great deal, uh, lover as he is of Rousseau's Reverie d'un promeneur solitaire. Uh, Descartes, it's safe to say, is nothing like Rousseau uh, in his ambling, peregrinating walk through the forest. Uh, Descartes, more of a 17th century Jair Bolsonaro, cutting a sway through the forest just as it suits him. Uh, and what raises a chuckle from Serre is that Descartes fancies that this route through the forest can be a straight path, uh, following what in the discours he says is a firm and decisive route to knowledge. Now, Serre's main problem with this is that Descartes has clearly never found himself in a forest in his life. Serre writes, has he ever attempted it? In order to define the said line, two points are necessary. This tree, for example, and another one further away run to it, and starting from this trunk, begin again and go forwards to a third. But no reference point guarantees that between the first and the second straight line, an infinitesimal angle will not appear. Repeat this as many times as necessary, with the result that you run the mighty risk of going round in circles and becoming ever more lost. Now, such a method may well work well enough in an aseptic flat space of Cartesian extension, uh, but as far as Serre is concerned, it's hopeless in the world in which, and this is dashed inconvenient for Descartes, we happen to actually live. No one sails that way, Serre very characteristically comments. Uh, no one, he says, succeeds in flying to the moon that way. Uh, both of those things require thousands of corrections and accommodations along the route, uh, responding to changes in current and changes in atmosphere, constantly rectifying miscalculations. That's how you get from one place to another. So in contrast to Descartes' straight path, uh, the Serre of Le Système de Leibniz favours the image of the web, the network, le réseau. Uh, logic, Serre argues, doesn't extend like a straight line, but it, quote, develops by composition of terms arranged in different directions, a composition that grows like a tissue, invading domain after domain, like expanding rings of water, close quote, with each new crossing or composition finding new models and carefully, painstakingly, falteringly relating them to other known models. So whereas for Descartes, then, to think is to bludgeon a straight line through a forest, for Leibniz and for Serre, to think is to, to dance across a web, uh, peregrinating the whole way. And this distinction profoundly shapes Serre's understanding of philosophy. Uh, analysis, he says, uh, still with Descartes in his crosshairs, uh, might be valuable with its clarity, rigour, precision and so on. But philosophy really has the opposite function, a federating and synthesising function. I think, he writes, that the foundation of philosophy is the encyclopedic and its goal is synthesis. Or as he puts it more succinctly in Le Gaucher Boiteux, federating, thinking, same difference. 
So whereas sir, we might think let's relations bloom like a wonderful English wild garden, uh, Descartes is always pruning them away uh, like a very geometric French garden. And this Cartesian, non-Cartesian combinatorial thinking, I submit, is just the sort of thinking that we require if we're to face the, what are often called the great challenges of our day. Because those challenges are also federations, aren't they, across many disciplines. And the, the salient example is climate change. Uh, it is a meteorological problem, it's a physical problem, it's a biological problem, it's a social problem, it's a psychological problem, it's an economic problem, and on and on and on. It's a problem that, that, that expresses itself in terms of myths and narratives and metaphors. Good luck trying to cut a straight path through that forest. So rather than being Cartesian bulldozers, bludgeoning our way through the forest, cutting our own little straight path and leaving wreckage in our wake, uh, the Cersian web-like and network-like thinking can help us to find a way towards a truer, more integrated approach to these issues. One that's able to walk round trees rather than knock them over. The second image that I'd like to dwell on is the image of a window and the way that it helps us see that Sayre thinks ecologically and not dualistically. Uh, it's a window through which the philosopher stares uh, in Les Cinq Sons, uh, contemplating from afar the beauty of the apple tree outside his air-conditioned study. And once more, Sayre can't suppress a weary chuckle when he discusses this linguistic philosopher who, having built himself a house of concepts and logic, sits in his study in his comfortable fifth arrondissement flat and gazes through his close window at the apple tree outside, uh, taking it upon himself to write a verbose dissertation on its blossoms, which he can neither touch nor smell, nor distinctively see through the glass. Uh, protected as he is from the wind, from the rain, from the sun, from the cold, from the fog, from the scent and from the light that make the tree what it really is. And conveniently, uh, forgetting that the frame and the curtains and the opaque glass window that insulate him from ever coming into contact with the object of his linguistic flights of fancy also prevent him from describing it in anything approaching adequacy. And the guilty party, of course, in this instance, is Maurice Meloponti uh, and his Phénoménologie de la Perception, uh, a book that Serre reports having laughed out loud at when he read the first sentence, which I will uh, uh, recount for us now. First sentence of Phénoménologie de la Perception. At the outset of the study of perception, we find in language the notion of sensation. Well, before the reader has even finished the first sentence then of this 500-page tome, perception has already, Serre laments, been reduced to language. And for his part, Serre doesn't simply open this window. He wants to let the tree teach him how to think and how to write. Now, what I mean by this is that he doesn't think that thinking is exclusively a preserve of human beings. For Sarah, everything thinks. Yes, everything. Stones, rivers, cities, crystals, planets, supermarkets, animals, even human beings. Everything thinks. Because everything receives, stores, processes and emits information. Sir writes, uh, writing is an energy, uh, and so the world writes just as much as we do, and better. It stores, processes, receives, and emits information just as much as we do, and better. And for Sir, this completely changes how we think. No longer do we think about the apple tree outside the window, now we think like the apple tree. In other words, the relationship between my thinking and the apple tree is no longer one simply of mimesis, me representing the tree in text. It is now one of methexis, participating in what the tree itself is doing. And it's completely appropriate then for Sir to write in Récit d'Humanisme, I write like light, like crystal, like a stream. I tell my story, he says, like the world. What does this mean? Well, he tells us what it means. The background noise, he says, of my body hears the background noise of the world. The world opens itself to me and I to the world. And as he writes in Biogé of a particular experience in a tent, uh, the interfering, we both vibrated together, like the canvas of the tent in the wind, with fear, with emotions, with similar movements. So writing is not something estranged then from the processes of the natural world, but it participates in 
those processes. Uh, work, Serge says, flows from me uh, like honey. Here we are, like a spider's web. I'm a bee or a spider, a tree. I no longer tell the difference between the world and secretion. Now, this might to some seem a fanciful, romantic way of thinking about writing, which, which has very little practical relevance for us. But I want to suggest very strongly that it is precisely the opposite. Because at the very moment when our relationship to the natural world is becoming an ever greater existential importance to us and to our existence, and at the moment when the profit motive in the neoliberal university increasingly militates against, and despite its own rhetoric, uh, uh, militates for the exploitation of the world and to considering it as a resource for the production of margin for the institution, says mythetic way of thinking, not only comes as a refreshing challenge, and that much it certainly is, but it's also actually a militant resistance to the prevailing drift of our institutions and the prevailing drift of our society. It situates us differently in relation to the natural world, which is one Im important step towards healing our relationship to the natural world. So thirdly, a cave. Not any old cave, the cave. Plato's cave. What does the escapee from Plato's cave find when he comes out uh, into the sunlight? Uh, well, for Michel Serre, what he finds is a noun. Uh, Plato's son, for Serre, is the archetypal noun, the transcendental signifier that sheds its rays of meaning abroad to the whole world with no shadow. Uh, the sun, is Pla in Plato's allegory for Serre, is substantial. It is the substance, the form, the eidos, the big daddy of all nouns. And Plato's solar substantivism is indicative of a wider trend in Western thinking for Sir. And he puts his finger on it in this quote. Traditional philosophy speaks in substantives of herbs, not in terms of relationships. Thus it always begins with a divine sun that sheds light on everything. And once more, Sir makes this suturing of philosophy to the noun faintly ridiculous. He, he makes us smile at it. Uh, he, he mocks it in telegraphic language, me arrive tomorrow, me be ego, being and nothingness. He likens it to playing the piano wearing boxing gloves. It's, it's a very clumsy way of thinking. In order to oppose this platonic method, Serre draws on his own cave, or rather he borrows one. Uh, he takes it from the 19th chapter of Jules Verne's The Vanished Diamond, in which Verne uh, describes an underground bejeweled cave into which the novel's heroes descend with lanterns and in which they, these lanterns glitter in the myriad jewels on the cave walls. And, and Verne's clay, cave, in, in a way that we don't have time to go into in this talk, but it's a systematic rewriting for Sir of Plato's cave allegory. I just want to pick one aspect uh, for now. The lights in Verne's cave, says Sir, uh, are not imposing, they're not self-generating like Plato's son. Uh, they're uh, um, glittering, uh, self-reflecting the, the, the light from the lantern. Uh, these lights are, are, are lights through, between, over, within reflections. So whereas Plato's sun is a noun, the glittering lights in Verne's cave are prepositional. And prepositions are really attractive to Sir because they transform things. They bring things into relation with each other. Every preposition lends itself to federating, without excluding, he says, without denying. Whereas semantic meaning is declarative, prepositional meaning is directional. It's spatial, it's temporal, it produces meaning, not as, not as a series of immovable, uh, substantial land masses, but as the shifting relation of ocean currents. And says, turn to prepositions is not just a matter of style. It facilitates a radically different imperative. Um, thinking, uh, he says, without reference, by relations, speaking by flexions or declensions. That's what prepositions do. Now, how can says prepositional thinking help us today? Well, perhaps this is one way. It helps us to see that we are not, should we need to be reminded of it once again, masters of the universe, manipulating discrete counters on a gaming board in front of us, as if we ourselves were not part of that game. And this is the danger of disjointed nominal thinking. Prepositional thinking positions us not as those who are playing the game, 
indeed as parasites within the game, interrupting the flow of the game from the inside. And in this way, prepositional thinking helps us to see that our thinking is always also a doing, always an intervention that moves through, around and over the world, rerouting its flows of energy and information. So then to conclude, what is a science of relations? When Sir thinks relationally, not relations between pre-existing substances, but like the symbiotic relations between parasites, say ourselves and our gut bacteria, um, relations that create and sustain the very uh, entities that they straddle. When we think in that way, I think he would say, we're thinking with the grain of the world that we're thinking about. A paper like this will inevitably do that sort of thinking a disservice, however, uh, because Serre is not doing what I've been doing. Uh, he's not describing how he thinks. He's actually doing it. He's not imitating a science of relations, but he's participating every time he weaves an anecdote with a theorem, every time he bounces from Sadi Kerno to Lucretius, every time he moves from Zola to Thales. And this perhaps is an important note to end on. Serre doesn't teach us how to think by describing how he thinks, or like Heidegger does, for example. He teaches us how to think by thinking. If we want Michel Serre to teach us how to think, we won't learn it from a book or from behind a window. Uh, we'll learn it from walking through a forest, uh, from writing like an apple tree, uh, or from descending into a sparkling cave, uh, which is why a talk like this can only go so far. Um, why I so look forward to discovering how the other papers uh, in this conference are going to take this marvellous practice that Sir performs in his work uh, and exceed what I've been able to describe in this paper and actually do some thinking along with Sir. Thank you.